is not up. Well, I stay in the live stream. Got it. Okay. And we are live. <laughs> there we go. With some effort, we're here, France. <laughs> so I I'm just want to apologize. We are live. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop on that side. Okay. So I don't hear myself. So thanks, France, for joining us. Apologies for anybody that's here listening to us live. Um, <laughs> we had some technical problems with Zoom. For some or other reason, Zoom threw us out. Um, but we're here. We're a few minutes late, so apologies for that. I hope you can watch the replay if you need to run to something else. Um, you can just uh, reply in France's chat or in mine on our live Facebook feed, and we will be able to send you the recorded link afterwards. We will also have it available um, for you on our Facebook pages. So anyway, that's the technical side. Thanks for joining me today, France. <laughs> Natasha, I'm very excited about this, even though we are 30 minutes late with all our technical problems. I love spending time with you because you're still one of my favorite people. Uh, you are actually also one of mine. I just want to introduce oh. you. This, <laughs> this is Franz Cronier. So he's actually um, my mentor uh, when it comes to counseling and um, being a pastoral counselor. And I actually want to thank you, Franz. Uh, I learned so much from you and I'm still learning. And it's an absolute honor to, to be able to spend this time with you live on Facebook. And so we're here today to get, learn a little bit from you. Um, and there's a lot to learn. So I know you have so much knowledge to share, but we're going to condense it down to just a little bit of knowledge. We're going to talk about finding your identity in Christ today. But let's first tell you just that everybody who's listening who, uh, who, who France is. Okay, so France is a pastoral counselor by day and an artist by night. But I don't know why you say by night or because in my opinion, you're a professional artist. So no, I don't um, always get time during the day to do art. <laughs> well, I know your hours are spent helping um, helping people in your ministry as a counselor. Your ministry's name is actually Land Ministries, Thank and I know you. you yes, and I know you've been counseling for about thirty years. <laughs> you have your own program. Twenty seven. Twenty seven. So it's almost thirty. <laughs> we'll round up. <laughs> Okay, so 27 years, so you have a lot of knowledge to share. You know how people struggle with their identities, uh, struggling in life. Um, I know you, uh, you've got so much compassion working with people. Uh, you've developed your own programs, and that's how I got connected with you to, to learn from you. And you've uh, been teaching at colleges and uh, churches and Bible colleges and small groups that is and nice. individuals. And I know you have taught a lot of counselors uh, and professional pastors on their journey on how to use resources uh, and the Bible in a very unique way, because your way is extremely unique, because you use art. <laughs> so everybody that's artists that are here, I'm so glad you listen in, but you don't need to be an artist because I don't know anything from art and I still learn from you, <laughs> France. So I want to thank you for being here. I know you want to share your screen and going to share a little bit. We're going to talk about finding your identity in Christ. So where would you like to start, France? Just jump in or um, can, we, can we start with a question? Well, first of all, I would just like to say hello. It's so nice to be here. I'm always excited to teach anything that I know something about. I would say that teaching is probably my number one passion in life. Um, no, let me rephrase that. My first passion in life is Jesus. <laughs> my second passion is to be a husband and a father. And my third passion is teaching. Teaching is quite um, an easy thing for me. It just seems to come naturally. I like to be fully prepared. And I'm definitely prepared for our talk this evening. So I hope that what I share with you is going to be meaningful, that you'll take something away from this, and that you will be inspired. Natasha is frozen. Yes, you are also frozen, but you're back. I see you find it. <laughs> you're back. 
Oh, you are frozen. There you're back. <laughs> okay, so I have not got a person. very nice face to be frozen. <laughs> <laughs> so those who are joining us from other places in the world, and I know we have some connections joining from other places. Uh, we have load sharing in South Africa, so sometimes we don't have always stability in our, <laughs> our sharing, but we work around it. So um, we should be okay for today, Ron. I my power is on, so <laughs> so um, let's get started, Franz, And maybe you can just share with us uh, why we we are choosing this name, finding your identity in Christ. Aren't we just supposed to find our own identity? We are made and created uniquely. Uh, why did we choose that title? Maybe you can share a bit and start there. <laughs> Many people search for their identity. And there is a, a natural unfolding of our identity as we grow up. But it's mostly based on the opinions of people. What people have taught us about who we are. And I think there are two main dimensions connected to our identity. And if we only have the one we're not going to be able to really thrive. And if we only have a spiritual identity, well, then we don't really know who we are in the natural world. So I think if we're able to marry those two things together, we must certainly have a winning recipe. So unfortunately, I'm not a psychologist. I know that you have started psychology, but somehow the Lord has always just put pictures in my mind that make sense to me, and I weave that with the word. And then eventually it seems to create a picture. So I don't have any claim to fame about anything that I know. I would, I would give all glory to the Lord and other people that I've learned from to be able to put anything together. Is it possible for me to share a screen now? Um, yes, I just need to check with all the struggles. Maybe we, uh, <laughs> we didn't make you co-host. Let me just make you one again. Because when we jumped in, I might have stopped that. Now you should be able to share, Franz. Go ahead. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yes, I can. Fantastic. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes. A guy and a girl. Your goal. pictures, me, myself, and I, the names I call myself. The search for authentic identity. We can have a false identity. In there. And, of course, today there's so much talk about gender identity. They claim that you're not just a man or a woman based on your biological gender, but you can now identify yourself as whatever. And there are more than 100 gender identities with pronouns. So it's become very confusing in our world. So I would like to keep things simple tonight. And um, it doesn't matter what you identify as, as a man or a woman. <laughs> or anything in between that you feel like expressing, your identity can only be rooted and grounded in two things. And if you have these two main tracks in your life, I can guarantee you that that is a winning recipe. In the storybook, Alice in Wonderland, Alice falls down this rabbit hole and she eventually ends up in this fantastical place. And as she's exploring it, she comes across this amazing caterpillar. He's sitting on a mushroom and he's taking deep puffs on his hooker, which we now they call bubblies. And he looks at this strange creature, this girl that he's never seen one before. And he says to her, explain yourself. Now, that's quite a scary thing for somebody to say to. I mean, if I said to you, you need to explain yourself to an alien, they've never seen a human being, you need to explain to them who you are, body, soul, and spirit, where you come from, what elements you're made up of, and it's quite a difficult thing, you know, if you've never done this before. And this is my passion to teach people how to explain themselves, to be able to tell their story, to be true to who they are, and to find their identity, not only in the natural realm, but also in the earthly realm. And as you quite rightly mentioned, Natasha, and that is that for the past three years, I've been incorporating art as a medium for visual communication. 
to help people really engage with whatever it is that I teach them. So what I'm sharing with you tonight is part of greater training that I do to enable people to become certified practitioners who are then also able to help people with art as a tool for therapy, teaching, demonstration, or experience. So what you see on the board is the two dimensions. So I'm starting at the bottom one, which is the natural dimension. I mean, we first realized that we are a physical being in the womb of our mommies. And then that physical being that we're born with gives us a certain temperament type and we have natural gifts. And based on those three things, most people will perceive us as to who we are in their appraisal of us. But there's another dimension, the supernatural dimension. And there we are not just born in the flesh, we can be born again as a divine creation. We then receive an identity in Christ. And we have redemptive gifts that supersede our natural gifts in life. And I think if, if we can marry those things together, and I mean, I, I can say this so quickly in two minutes, but to experience it, of course, can take many years. I myself had a hard time with my identity. I was quite confused about my identity as a child because my temperament was uh, one that is more gentle. My natural gifts were all the kind of gifts that you imagine girls would have. I mean, I wanted to make clothes for my dolls and I did ballet and I played piano and I did embroidery and crochet work and I sang in the choir. And I hung out with my mom, arranged flowers and baked cakes. So of course that led to me being labeled and ridiculed. And by the time that I was 16 years old, I came to the conclusion that I don't fit in, that I don't belong. And the only place that I actually fitted in was in the gay community. So I started having boyfriends pursuing that and it led to a myriad of problems, fears, insecurities, low self-esteem, not knowing what I'm about, and just floating in a sea of choices. Well, eventually I found the Lord, and once my supernatural dimension became corrected, I was able to even talk about or think about, you know, what the natural dimension has given me. So in the natural, I would say that I was a flop in my eyes <laughs> and in the eyes of those around me. Because all I ever got was rejection, labeling. I could look forward to school being an emotional concentration camp on a daily basis. So I'm very thankful to the Lord for what he's taught me in my personal journey. And for me to have corrected these foundations, I would say as a believer, it took me about 16 years of journeying with Jesus in a close relationship before these things really be began to fall in place for me. Wow, from 16 years. Sorry, can I interrupt there? That yeah. is quite a journey. What would you say to parents with teenagers struggling to find their identity in this crazy world today. So I'm interrupting your presentation, but I know you work with so many oh, I parents love it. I want you to pastors. Yes. Um, yeah, and you probably you I know you see a lot of teenagers and people in your counseling room struggling with this on a daily basis. How do you encourage them on this journey when it's it's such a long journey? It's not just instant in an hour fixed and now we're done. <laughs> yes, what I tell them. I tell them that you should be grateful and thankful that you've met me because I can fast track you a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it took me 16 years to learn. I okay. can help people to learn that in six weeks. Yeah, wow. So when we struggle on our own in the dark, you know, we don't have an a clue, a clue of where we're going. So I think part of the fivefold ministry is that people nowadays approach discipleship, you know, from a body, soul, and spirit level. In the olden days, it just to be just spiritual. 
So I'm thankful that the Lord has guided me in the way that he has and the knowledge that I have. So if I can get back to just our discussion is that the first thing that we want to, to have in this journey is to know who we are. And we can only know who we are by doing research, by doing evaluation tests, and there are many today, understanding of what makes us us and accepting ourselves. Because sometimes we learn and we discover and we're disappointed in who we are. We think, but I don't want to be this. I don't want to be me. I'd rather be him or her or somebody else. But acceptance says... I have to accept who God made me to be. Physically, mentally, emotionally, in terms of my temperament, my giftings. Many people walk around with self-rejection. Now, we will all experience rejection somewhere between the womb and the tomb in our lives. We don't have a choice whether other people reject us or not. But we do have a choice whether we will reject ourselves or not. And even for myself, it was um, a huge part of my healing was to become comfortable with myself, to know that I am validated and affirmed by Jesus, that he made me to be the way that I am. And I don't have to reject any part of me, even if few people on earth like what I'm about and who I am. I have to be okay with who I am. So I think accepting in the knowing stage of yourself is vital. Because if we can't accept ourselves, well, then no amount of work or growth will take place within us. Now, as I said, we use art. So I just want to show you a typical page that we would do like this in terms of art therapy or as an art tool, uh, the, the very discussion I'm having with you now, I will sit down with a client or a classroom or a small group of people and I'll say, okay, you need a piece of paper, you know, just a sheet of paper. And we're gonna use simple tools, not expensive art materials. I mean, most of us have a set of coloring in pencils lying around and I use a black pen just, you know, a normal writing pen. And these are waxes, wax crayons that most children will use. And a very inexpensive set of watercolor paints. And you can buy this at your local supermarket. You don't even have to go to a fancy art store. And if you have so a I can go and I can go and dig in my kids' boxes. <laughs> exactly. Can... We use kids' materials. Everything we used to play with in nursery school. That's exactly what we use. Um, so when people hear, you know, that I teach art therapy or um, how to use art, they immediately think, oh, now I have to go to art school, be artistic, learn how to draw. Well, as you can see from this picture, there's very little. To do. This is a cut out picture that was cut in half. We've made some circles and we wrote in some words. And this is a form of engaging in what I'm teaching. And you know what? Once you have this picture, it's not like a set of notes that somebody said, read this. It is something that you made. It's unique in how you experience it. And at the end of the day, you're just going to remember it so much better. So let's get past that. So as I said, there's a supernatural realm and a natural realm. And that's where our picture here has been cut in half. We cannot just live in the one half. So yeah, in the natural realm, we have a family of origin. God made Adam and Eve. The first command to them was go have sex, make babies, populate the planet. So our physical being comes from Adam and Eve through our mom and dad to who we are now. You need a sperm cell and an egg cell to make a baby. But in the supernatural realm, we also have a parent. Father God. He's a spiritual being and he gives birth to our spirit. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit. So we are born from our parents, but we can be born above, from above 
through Father God, through the redeeming work that Jesus did for us on the cross. Okay, let's just zoom in on those two concepts a little. So obviously the question, where do babies come from? That's normally what children ask their parents. Where did I come from? Some people tell them stupid stories, you know, like you were a monkey and they chopped off your tail and then we adopted you. <laughs> or the stork brought you in a nappy. No, mommy and daddy made me. Now, Natasha, this is, of course, your passion. In life because yes. you speak to parents and teenagers about sex, reproduction, and you know, how to apply that in a good way. So definitely your mom and your dad made you. As gross as what it sounds, they actually had sex. Your daddy <laughs> donated a sperm. And it's a sperm cell that wins the race that determines whether you're a boy or a girl, depending on the genetic makeup, whether we do get 23 female chromosomes or 22 plus one Y chromosome. So in my case, the Y chromosome or sperm cell won the race and thus I'm a boy. But within the hormonal soup in the womb, there can be a decision or some things can go wrong that you can be born an intersex baby. Then you're not going to be so certain, am I a boy or a girl? Because such babies have private parts of both girls and boys. It's quite ambiguous. And the doctor can't announce whether you're a boy or a girl. So intersex babies, they're kind of lucky because they get to choose how to live their lives as boys or girls. While the rest of us kind of Suck it up, you're a boy or a girl. Okay. So your genetics determine, for better or for worse, <laughs> your physical features. So I've got quite a long nose. I don't like showing it from the side because I have a little bit of a complex over it. <laughs> Our physical features can, I've got bandy legs, believe it or not. I used to be a ballet dancer, but I always struggled with my bandy legs. My vrouw sê altijd, ek kan nie vark van. Hy is een recht hier. <laughs> your skin, your eyes, your hair color, your build, your face shape, your height, the sound of your voice. I mean, oftentimes we look at a little boy and we go, yo, that one really looks like his dad. The appel ket nie ver van die boom. You know, or that little girl is a splitting image of a mom. Well, it's genetics. Now, we don't necessarily always like our genetics. Many of us will stand in front of a mirror and go, uh-uh, I speak a deal. If only this was better. Now, of course, you can go for surgery. You can enhance it. I can shorten my nose and straighten my legs. I can get implants and Botox. and uh, You can change your hair color easily, Natasha. Yes. Is that your natural hair? Should I ask? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I am. <laughs> okay, let's Although get off I, this topic. Yes. Uh, you know, mom and dad makes us, but at the so same time that genetics are forming us, God is placing within us a spirit, a human spirit. And that spirit is also passed down from Adam to every other human being. Because remember, God poured his spirit, he breathed his very spirit into Adam. And as a deposit in Adam, his human spirit, the rest of the human race came out of that. God never breathed into Eve's nostrils. So it says here in Psalm 139, very famous song, you created my inmost being, okay, my spirit. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So what is God knitting together? I imagine him sitting you know, with big knitting needles and umbilical cord kind of knitting a baby at the end of it. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Some of us are more fearfully than wonderfully made. No, I'm just joking. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Now, this was written in a day where there were no sonars and no scans. Nowadays, a pregnant mommy can go and get a 3D scan of a baby. You can see exactly what that baby looks like in the womb. 
Now it says here, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Some people believe this is predestination. I don't believe in predestination. But I do believe that God has a dream for our life. He knit us together and that as we unfold and flower and flourish, our life will unfold into all the days according to God's dream. Now, you are a precious package. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you follow God's dream, that's the little red line that you see there on the screen. This red line will give expression to your physical appearance, your intelligence, your temperament, your personality type, your redemptive gifts, talents, your energy and health, your relational strengths, dreams, education, calling, spirituality. I mean, you could add lots of things in there. If we live according to God's plan, that book of days that is written for us, we will come to the end of our life as this picture of this beautiful lady, and you will have reached your destiny. You will have a sense of fulfillment. You will have integrity that you were true to who you are, and you lived as your authentic self. Why do you want to die a copy of somebody else? Be an original. God makes each one of us an original. Now, in our world, we don't always get affirmed for being the original that we are. Many people, you know, will dislike us or criticize us or reject us. And I believe that if it was predestination, then all of us will reach that end goal, but it's not. You have a will. Satan has a will. The world has a will and God has a will. And God has refrained from exercising his sovereignty upon mankind by giving us all a free will to choose. So if I make wrong choices or other people make choices on my behalf and I become victimized, I'm not going to reach this end goal. Or if Satan, the thief, comes to steal, kill, and destroy along the way and destroy my foundations in my search for who I am in life, I will not reach that final destination. So I believe that every child of God has a responsibility set before us that we should discover who we are and be the best that we can be with the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in us to reach that point. Now, Natasha, I don't know how you feel or those who are joining us this evening. I'm sure you, you want to reach your destiny or, or you want to die halfway through this journey. Yeah, I think it's building all of us to believe that we have been created for something more than just being on earth, to serve and to reach that calling, I almost must say, <laughs> that God, your destiny, like you said, yes. And yeah, we want to live to the fullest in that calling. Now, in your life, has it just unfolded by itself or did you have to do some work along the way? Oh, hard work. <laughs> Yeah, it takes some work. Um, I think a lot of when uh, I also work with clients, they think that God will come and tell you what you need to do. And I would say, mm -hmm. well, I'm not Moses. And I know, I don't think God will speak to, <laughs> through with me with a burning bush. So uh, I haven't experienced that yet. So but with a lot of hard work, finding myself doing hard things, uh, doing things that that I felt like, no, why am I supposed to do this? Asking for forgiveness, more hard things. You actually find who you truly are in Christ. So yes, I would say hard work, Franz. <laughs> yes, it you, comes you with the hard work and to do deliberate actions and to be intentional about it. And um, I mean, even if somebody is listening to this teaching that I'm sharing here with you tonight, and this is a nutshell, remember this is part of a big um, amount of training that I offer that covers three years, the soul care training package. Yeah, I'm not and saying, people... sorry, yes. I interrupted you. Now, I, I was putting you in a, a little bit of a box 
because I know you have so much to share because it takes three years to learn all of these things. It's not you know, just... People get shocked when they hear that the training is three years. They think, oh, well, it should be about, you know, six weeks. Hmm, <laughs> that's a problem. We live in an instant society. We just want quick fixes and quick recipes, but uh, to, to journey in our sanctification process is exactly that. It's a process. It's not a destination. It starts at birth, it gets, you know, accelerated in Christ. And in our lifetime, we, we continue down this journey that God has for us. And as we, we uh, take time to absorb things and to learn things and to unlearn things and to be challenged, to make the choices. But I definitely don't want to end up one day in an old age home, or a stoop, or a wheelchair, <laughs> or a hospice bed, or a deathbed, knowing that somehow I've missed what God wanted me to achieve in my life. Of course, it's not easy. And that's why it takes three years for me to see a student regularly on a weekly basis. That we can lay the foundations you know, of who God is, how we relate to him, what the things are that block us. Once we have a good understanding of God, we, we begin to even think about understanding ourselves. And then that should all result in helping us to love our neighbor. So the three-year pro program that I have is based exactly on that. To love the Lord our God, to love yourself in order that you can love your neighbor. Well, let's continue. Wait, I want to jump in, Franz. I've got a question. Yes, point. Point. <laughs> so point. this, you refer to a student. What type of student is this? Who can join? Is it a journey for yourself? Uh, maybe just explain a little bit. What type of students do you serve? Help through this journey. Okay. My students range in age groups from 19 right up to 70. I would say the average age is usually sort of between the ages of 30 and 45, because normally by then people have a desire to help other people. So the training that I do is firstly to equip people to be counselors, um, to have a counseling approach if you're a pastor, if you're a teacher to understand yourself and your children better and what you can invest in the lives of those children. If you are a friend, or a hairdresser. Do you know how many hairdressers come to me for training? Because oh, hairdressers well, and barmen are very good counselors. <laughs> they spend a lot of time listening and interacting with people. Yes. And um, anybody who has a passion to help other people grow and find freedom and health and spirituality in their lives and to grow in their relationships, those are the kind of students that I have. Now, not only is the training that I have equipping to enable you to help other people, but it is transformative for you as the student. Mm -hmm. So I don't ever want to have an academic course that says, okay, we're going to teach you principles or theories because it's just dead knowledge. I mean, you can go buy a book and read up theories. I want to be involved in people's lives that every single time that they come to a class with me, that they will leave that classroom not being the same that they were before they came there. I want people to learn, to experience the Lord, to be touched in an inner man, to be surprised by new knowledge. And for me, it's an investment in the individual first, the student. So a student can be a man, a woman, an old person, a younger person. It doesn't really matter where you are in life. And just because I incorporate art uh, only for the past three years, before that I did mostly you know, support groups and Bible college training. Um, just because we incorporate visual communication now, is, this is not just for artists. Definitely not. I think anybody who works with any, and I mean you, Natasha, for example, you're saying you're not an artist. And I disagreed with you last week. 
I said, that's nonsense because I came to one of your presentations and you had such beautiful visuals. I mean, you had a slideshow and just putting a slideshow together makes you hard because it's visual communication. With every slide you're choosing, color, composition, sizing, big words, small words. I mean, that makes you an artist. So your art medium that you use, of course, is a PowerPoint slide, but you can very easily produce something like this, that I'm taking you through these steps now. The only thing is no one has taught you to you yes. had to learn to make slides, right? With a yes. click of a mouse. <laughs> a lot of hard work done there. But I know the power of when I use that visual, uh, prompt. Exactly. when I present that, uh, yes. every picture is chosen on purpose because yes. it relays a message. Because when I want my parents and kids walking away, they want to remember that picture, to remember the concept that I was delivering and this is exactly what you do the whole three years every concept that you are teaching like this one that you're showing us now yep. has the yep. visual cues and memories and it's even more powerful because when you use your hand to write it's very powerful to commit yep. that to memory i mean you now sitting looking at the screen but i would challenge you paint the screen make the screen cut out a picture you know draw these circles on a page don't just Look at it and sit there, uh, like take it all in mentally. Uh, in, involve your senses, you know, your smell, because there's a wonderful smell that you get from wax crayons and from paint. Get your fingers dirty. And I mean, and make a mess. There's no right or wrong way to do this. It's just, this is my suggestion. And then you play and interact with your art materials. We listen better when we're trying to do what we're being told. We remember better when we have this. Did you know that Jesus was an art therapist? When he was drawing in the, gra in the ground. With his he spirit. did writing on the ground. Yeah. Um, he made mud pies. I mean, how art therapy is that? And he made it with his spit. <laughs> <laughs> Stuck yes. it on somebody's eyes. I mean, that's a form of art therapy. He left his fingerprints in that. And then he was constantly drawing visual pictures for people. Every parable that he taught was based on something that people can see, make a picture from, and remember the principle. And now I'm not certain whether he ever drew anything, but I'm sure that he did because he was a carpenter. He was in the creative field. He was a designer. And I mean, after all, he's God the creator. I'm convinced he made pictures for people. Definitely. <laughs> well, if I was a little kid and Jesus came past, I would have shown him my sketchbook, my, my charcoal sticks, and I'm convinced he would sit and draw. Oh, fine. <laughs> okay, so yeah, in the natural realm, based on our genetics and what our parents have given us and sort of family traits, God knits into us our own temperament, all the good, the bad, and ugly of it. But at the same time, in the heavenly realm, he redeems us from the bad and the ugly. Franz, maybe you can explain a little bit redeem for some of the younger people that might not know what that means. It's a big okay. word. If you're not I'm going to share it with you now. We're going to break it down. Let's just go oh, back to okay. temperament. Okay. The temperament is in the natural. As I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. It's inborn. It's not chosen. You cannot choose your temperament. Not at all. And your temperament differs from your character. Character is based on your values and your interactions. Temperament has to do with how you process the world around you. How you have an inner digestion of that and how you will give that back to the world around you. It's inborn, it's set in concrete, it's part of your DNA. It, it cannot be taken out of you. You can't take it to a swap shop and buy a new temperament. It's woven into you. Now, there are two ways to discover temperaments. One is with Hetty Britz. She's a very well-known um, author. 
teacher and therapist here in South Africa. I think she's living in America at the moment. She's written a book Lisa. for parents and children. And she breaks it down into four temperaments, palm tree, rose bush, pine tree, boxwood tree. So you can get hold of Hetty's um, material. All of it is online. She's done some brilliant work to help us to understand temperament in simple terminology, not wrapped up in you know, psychological dogma. Then another guy whose temperament stuff I really like is Hippocrates. He lived 400 years before Christ. He was a Greek physician and he, and he was a bit of a scientist, you know. He started figuring out that there really are just four main temperaments in people. And he based this on bodily fluids. The sanguine people are red and bubbly. They're just full of life. They sunshine. They're optimistic. Um, they jump into things, boots and all. And they, they are dramatic. And they're extroverts. And they're emotional. Um, I think you have a bit of sanguine in you. <laughs> then we get the phlegmatics. They are full of phlegm. They're a bit slower. They're like a snail with a trail. They don't get super excited about life, a little bit withdrawn, quiet, reserved. Phlegmatics are not quick processes. They have a slower process. And they're very loyal, slightly boring. Their favorite color is probably beige. Their favorite vegetable is probably gem squash. <laughs> not too much spice on it. <laughs> <laughs> but they are the backbone of society because they get the job done. They don't fluctuate. If you ask a phlegmatic to do a job, they will not do it overnight, fast-paced, but they will do it the best with detail, and they are just fantastically loyal. Then, of course, we get the melancholics. I'm one of those. Deep, dark, depressed. You, you never see the silver lining around the dark cloud. You just see the dark cloud. You have get up so you write poetry about the dark cloud. You um you want to draw other people into the dark cloud. So melancholics are, are high on feeling. They are very often introverts. They poets, artists, always tortured in some way. And um but they're interesting people. You know, they, they bring a lot of color and depth to our world. There's nothing superficial about melancholic people. And then we get the cholerics. They are the lawmakers, the sheriffs, the chiefs, the matrons, the leaders. And um, they like the law. They like to write the law and make sure that everybody keeps the law. They're not very often moved by empathy and compassion. They can come across as a little bit harsh, but they are the backbone of society. You know, where the rest of the world is falling apart, they like Nils Mikuso. <laughs> That's good. They keep the budgets. They keep everybody towing the line. Now, it's wonderful if you are a leader, but um, choleric pastors can sometimes be a little bit harsh on their flow because they sometimes preach more the law than love and compassion. But be it as it may, all these temperament types are beautiful in and of themselves. They've got good points, they have bad points, and they've got ugly things about them. Like the ugly thing about me is that I can fall into self-pity and depression just like this. And I can wallow in it. So I've had to take responsibility for it, you know, because it's a weakness. Now, if we only had our temperaments cast in concrete, then I think we become victimized by ourselves, don't we? Because it's like, yeah. oh, is this as good as it gets? No, our temperaments can be redeemed. And this is the word redemption that you spoke about. Oh, you. Do you have a question at this stage? I was just wanting to make a comment before you go to the redemption side. Oh, yeah. It's just so interesting when we look at that temperaments. Uh, when we look at it, 
we tend to think, or I'm not sure if the listeners are thinking that, I don't want to be that, that one that is moody or that one that's so strict. And I yeah, think that's yeah. where the challenge lies, because you don't want to be that way. And then when you deny that and not see the beauty that's in that, because for every temperament, there's a good and a bad side <laughs> and ugly, like you said. I love I think what that's, you that's where we struggle with finding our identity, I think. Part I of love it. what you're saying. Remember, I said just now it comes with acceptance. Yeah. You do the test. Oh, and by the way, let's just go back to this. Um, this is what I wanted to tell the, the listeners. I am willing to share with you um, a test, a temperament test. I can send oh, you okay. a temperament test, a redemptive test, as well as your portrait in Christ, three documents. All you have to do is follow the links with, which Natasha will put up and also share, you know, on Facebook with you. So you just have to go to our landing page, you know, fill in your basic details and we will email it to you free of charge. So that would be a very good thing. To do. So I can send you the temperament test. It's all self-explanatory. You just um, answer all the questions. You know, it's like choose between this and that. Add up the numbers and you get a full explanation of it. It's a very simple little test and it's always like spot on. Fantastic. So I do that list. with most of my clients, especially people who are struggling with identity and with, you know, low self image. To accept who you are. I'm always a little bit jealous, you know, of the sanguine people. Because it's just always so happy, happy, happy. Sometimes I want to bash them with a hammer in the forehead because, you know, happy people irritate me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to laugh. <laughs> okay, so do the test. We'll send it to you. Black. Natasha's okay, brilliant at that. Okay, yeah, I put in the chat for those who's listening live. In the chat, you will see it's free temperament test. So just click on that link, give us your email, and then France will make sure you get the test. For you I'd to love to share it with you. Love to share it. Okay, so as we said, in the natural realm, we have our temperament, but in the spiritual realm, we can be redeemed in terms of the bad and the ugly. In Colossians 2, verse 10, it says, And you are in him, this is now Jesus, made full and having come to fullness of life. In Christ, you too are filled with the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you reach full spiritual stature. You are complete in him. In other words, nothing is missing, nothing is lacking. So whatever we find lacking in ourselves, Jesus has come to give us fullness. Now, here's what redemption means. Redemption means we are sinners. We are born in sin. We all have sin. And sin disqualifies us from being in God's presence and being partakers of his eternal kingdom. We can try and fix that by being good, being righteous, making better choices, being more loving, you know, uh, following God's laws written on the tablets of our hearts. And we can score brownie points with God, so to speak. And now here's what God says about that effort. He says, your best effort at righteousness are like filthy rags, really dirty menstrual cloths. He's saying even your best effort to be holy will not really qualify because, you know, maybe today I scored 10 brownie points, but tomorrow I lose two, so I'm back to eight. And then I lose another three, now I'm down to five. So when is my goodness ever good enough? And when is my badness ever bad enough? So you and I can try to improve ourselves, but we can't. We cannot save ourselves. We can follow the law, but we cannot keep the law all of the time. So Jesus said, where there must be punishment for sin, he will come and take that punishment. It's kind of like saying to a child in the room, Okay, daddy's going out quickly. I don't want you to eat these sweeties. Let me show you my sweeties. I really love sweeties. You can see I have a whole box full of them. All my students can partake in these sweeties. 
Okay. There are all kinds of fudges and toffees and eclairs and things in there. Yummy sweets. Now, let's say I left this jar here and I say to the child, I don't want you to take any of these sweets, okay? And I come back and I see that some of the sweets are gone and I ask the child, did you take these sweets? No, daddy. So turn out your pockets, let me see. And they're full of empty wrappers. No, but you did take of these sweeties. Oh, no. Yes, daddy, I did. Okay, thanks for that confession. But you know that I told you that if you steal, there's a consequence. I'm going to have to get the spoon now and give you 20 lashes on your gluteus maximus. If you don't know what that is, it's your bottom. <laughs> now the child starts screaming and crying. And then the granny comes out of the room and she says, what's happening? I go, no, this child needs to be taught a lesson. This is the punishment for the son of stealing sweeties. You've got to take 20 lashings. And the granny says, no, you can't do that. You'll kill, you'll kill the poor child. I go, no, but that's the punishment. And she says, wait, can I make a deal with you? I will take his punishment. And then you can let him go. And I said to the child, did you hear this? Your granny will take your beating. Do you want this? Yes, daddy, don't hit me. <laughs> okay. So granny comes and she bends over and I whack the living daylights out of her with my wooden spoon. 20 oh, oh, granny. <laughs> she's screaming, she's crying, she's bleeding, she's weeping, she's bleeding. Do you think that child's going to feel some kind of remorse? I should hope so, unless if he's a psychopath. Yeah. So now granny has paid the price for him. She's taken his punishment on herself. And now the child can go scot-free. But granny's saying, I want something in return from you. I want you to love me. I want you to come and thank me every day. I want you to come to my room every week and I will show you my scars as a reminder of what I did for you. And now that I have made it easy for you to live your life without scars, I am making you complete in your daddy's eyes. Your daddy will forgive you completely. He's never going to punish you ever again, ever again, for having taken those sweets. So this is what redemption means. Jesus came to, to take our punishment on himself. That when we simply believe in him, invite him into our hearts, surrender our lives to him, believe in our hearts that he's the son of God, confess with our mouth we are saved. That's called propitiation, the unvendement. It's the activation of our faith. Right. It's a simple step. Anybody can do it. And then once we are in Christ, a supernatural thing happens called justification. In the heavenly realms, we are the Declared complete, as the scripture says, complete. We reach full spiritual stature. In other words, you, you can't be more complete than complete. You know, when you built a puzzle and all the puzzle pieces are in place, it's complete. You can't add more. Yeah. And this is what Jesus has done. He's made us completely acceptable to the Father. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We, we become an intimate member of his household. And that is instant, it is justification, it is eternal, and the only person that can change that is you. God will never take your name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Once he's written it there, it's there for keeps. You have eternal life. But you can take your name out by renouncing Christ, saying, I no longer believe in Jesus Christ. I will not confess him as the Lord. I refuse to believe the Bible and turning my back on Jesus and Christianity and all that jazz. But I'm speaking to an audience tonight that doesn't want to do that. I, I certainly don't want to. I don't know about you. I wanted to quit in my journey with Jesus, but like never really renounce him. So this is a wonderful thing. Jesus covers a multitude of our sins and our weaknesses. And redemption in him enables us that even those weaknesses that we don't like are no longer counted as sin against us. And we don't become sin conscious. We become Jesus conscious. 
we're like, okay, even though I'm flawed and the things I want to do, I don't, and the things I don't want to do, I do. I mean, that's just part of human nature, you know, our fallen nature. But Jesus comes to redeem us. And redeem means we submit to him. We allow him to control us, not our temperaments. You can either be a slave to your temperament, or you can make your temperament a slave to Jesus. So I love what Tim LaHaye says. He says we must have spirit-controlled temperaments. Because we can hide behind our temperaments. I can tell you, lost my ethics, snickerig, I'm a melancholic, don't come near me. I'll bite you. <laughs> yes. That's so true. <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying? I can't hide behind that. I need to go and pray and say, Lord, my melancholia wants to control me today and push me away from people. It's making me nasty. I'm not producing the fruit of the spirit. So, so help me to curb my temperament a bit. So what I've taught people to do is to put on the happy face. Pinch your cheeks, slap them a little bit and say, happy face, you practice in the mirror. You see, you fake it till you make it. And then eventually like, okay, now I can smile and be happy. And now I have a spirit-controlled temperament because I'm choosing to submit this. But if we don't have Jesus in our life and the redemption and the work of the Holy Spirit, I mean, then we really are just slaves to our temperament. Yes. So temperament means exactly that. And then in our justified position in Christ, this is the spiritual stature that we have. Now, I have just a whole lot of words written here. But I've, I've turned this into a Bible study. So if people send us the email, we will send them this as well. You know, the, your true identity in Christ. And it's vital that we will learn this, study it, memorize it, make it a part of our journey. That this becomes the primary deciding factor of who we will be on this planet. That we will know that, that this is what God thinks of us. This is what he declares us to be and not the world. Do you have a comment? Well, I think this is fantastic. So we can get this like in a, in a Bible study to see who we are in yeah. Christ. All the scripture references neatly packaged for you. It will take you at least a month and a half to meditate on that Bible study wow. daily. It's brilliant. It changed my life completely, really. I cannot even tell you how foundational this is. And I think any believer on earth that does not get taught this as part of their basic discipleship, they are just so much poorer because of that. You know, our world is full of religion, but we, we, we don't always focus on the important things. And this is an important thing. This is like the gift that Jesus came to give us. And it's for free. Yeah. And then not only do we have our natural temperament in the natural realm, we also have natural gifts. Our natural gifts are usually used to glorify ourselves. And our redemptive gifts are given to us by God. And the goal for that is always to glorify God. Because it is literally a manifestation of heaven in us, through us, to make the world a better place and to lead people back to the loop of the creator of that gift. So can I, can I expand a bit on those two? Yes, please. Okay, natural gifts and talents. Some people say, oh, I could you buy a talent? And no, you are lying. That's not the truth. <laughs> God has given every person on earth several talents we don't necessarily always get time to develop all of them we don't necessarily <laughs> you know, always have time money and energy to do so but uh, we all have gifts we all have talents and we should not compare ourselves to one another i love the way the bible says do not compare yourselves to one another only compare yourself to yourself <laughs> you know so i might look at um you, for example, Natasha, because you are very good in your, uh, uh, let's see, what are you very good at? You are very good in your interpersonal skills with people. I struggle with interpersonal skills. 
doesn't come naturally for me. And you are logic smart. You can do computers like a wizard. <laughs> Although it failed us this day. I have watched you use that little Apple Mac of yours, the way that you type, I'm like, oh, no, that nobody can you know, keep up with you. And then I'm jealous. I'm like, oh, I feel bad because I should be like that. And if I compare my skills to yours, I'm like, hmm, but I don't have that skill. And it's okay. I'm at peace with it. So you can have a musical talent. You can have interpersonal intrapersonal to be self smart you know a lot of self understanding linguistic very good with languages um, you can be logical and mathematical you can be a naturalist and really enjoy nature i mean wow i, li I listen to my sister in law we'll sit somewhere in a stoop and visit and then she says oh, did you hear that bird and she calls the name of the bird i'm like what that's a fool okay? <laughs> She says, that the surf walking. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that there's even a bird called that. So nature smart, she knows trees, insects, birds, you name it. I know a few birds. I know the dodo bird, the ostrich, and the eagle. Or and a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and what for the mossy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, mossy. <laughs> a little <laughs> sparrow. And then, of course, some people are spatial smart. They're very picture smart. They can see pictures, draw pictures, photograph pictures, put pictures together. And some people are body smart in the sense that they love fitness, health, workouts, gym, uh, exercise, and all of that. They become the, the fitness trainers of the world. Or even there, we can have doctors and nurses, you know, people understandable so we all have a little bit of this some people have just really strong one of those uh you know like you might get a maths with it, a savant yeah. somebody who sucks at everything else in life but yo they can do maths yeah. and we were like <laughs> give them a freaking nobel prize for their mathematical abilities they change the world with their maths and we all have a bit of this. So we need to discover what we have, love the gifts that we have, and dedicate time and energy to that. The cruel thing is the world around us doesn't always recognize our gifts, and they don't always praise them. Let's say you have a father who's a professor of maths, and you want to do music or art. He's going to diss you. He's going to say, yeah, man. This why I friends. I friends and Morpheus. <laughs> what about Sorry, can I, may I add something here, from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to add something here. And I, I think this is so powerful for you to share this, especially with uh, teachers. Because um, yeah. I think I work with so many teenagers that feels like if they don't have essay colors in whatever area in life they they don't have any yeah. talents and i yeah. think our our standard becomes so high in the schools like you it's need ridiculous. to do like yes it's ridiculous. and now this, our poor children feel like they have no talent is that really true and i think we teachers being encouraged by learning these skills from you to see the value in each child to help them find that natural gift and it's not saying you are essay champ it's so powerful the world we need teachers absolutely. knowing these stuff absolutely yeah. yeah you know what if you're in a mainstream academic school that's sport oriented if you don't excel in academics or sport then what are you you're nothing in a notebook I'm so glad that my parents put me in the art, ballet, and music school when I went to high school because it really impacted my life in the sense that I could develop my talents. I could spend, you know, between four and eight hours per day learning to be a dancer and choreography and to understand music, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you know, to perform on a stage. That was was really wonderful. If I had stayed in an ordinary mainstream school. I probably would have been extremely suicidal by the age of 16 because my specific brand 
of talent would not have been recognized, you know, or applauded or rewarded. Mm -hmm. yes. So yes, I think if parents and caregivers of children especially can, can discover the talent of that child. In, in some translations in the Bible, it says, train up a child in the bent that it is, and it will not depart from it. And it kind of means oh, wow. discover this child's temperament and talents and train them in that so that they can become the best and they'll never depart from it. You know what breaks my heart, Natasha? I have adults who come to me for art classes at the age of 40 or 50. Then I ask them, well, what's your journey with art? And usually they say, when I was a child, I used to love drawing and painting. I was just like doodling all day long. And I really wanted to do art. But my parents didn't appreciate it. My mother told me, it's useless. I must rather learn how to cook and iron. My dad frowned on it. He refused, you know, to push me in that direction. Mm. And as a result, they were damaged as children because they, they were made to, made to believe that that is a rubbish talent. It's a waste of time. You can't make a living of it. And it's just stupid to pursue that. And then they were forced, you know, to go into nursing or uh, bookkeeping or, or something that's not their natural bent. Yes. So I think in terms of work, career, and um, being an authentic person, discover your talent and love it. We all have talents. We all have all of these. So find the one that you love the most and develop that one the most. Yes. I Working in that thing and become the best. And if you have four talents, you know, just you're probably not going to get to develop them all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> but throughout our seasons of life, we can develop. And then your redemptive gifts. I only learned about this one later on. Somebody who's put together um, a brilliant teaching on this is Arthur Burke. He really is the pioneer in this. The Bible mentions it as being prophet, somebody who's creative with design and insight, a servant who has a platform of authority, but they always uplifting other people. Teachers take responsibility to understand things and detail and to, to put that across in such a way that people can learn it. An exhorter is strong in communication, bonding, initiating, a giver, stewardship, mobilizing, financing. Rulers, they give people the freedom to come together and to build something and to complete something. And mercy ministry, they like intimacy. They find fulfillment in rescuing what I call the LSD squad. Lame, sick, and dead. Okay. <laughs> Any person, you know, who's going through a hard time in life and, and they need to be encouraged or, you know, physically taken care of or mentally, the mercy ministry is always reaching out with hands-on care. I mean, they just don't just arrive at your house with a scripture. They will come and wash your feet, uh, wash and iron your linen, clean out the room, uh, cook you a meal, feed you, and you know, come back tomorrow and do some more. Now, are we all all of these things? No. But we are made to believe by the pressure in the body of Christ that we have to be all these things. Sure, we can have little bits and pieces of everything, but the real discovery is which one of these am I? In which one of these do I score the highest? You won't score zero in any of them, let me tell you that. But for example, in my life, teacher is by far the highest that the test reveals. And then I thought, okay, so if I'm a teacher, 
then how am I going to become the best teacher that I can? How am I going to dedicate my life to this? And if I'm a teacher, I have to have something to teach. So I've literally dedicated 27 years of my life to develop resources, training, courses, groups, videos, books. I mean, you name it. I've loved all of it. And it makes me feel a great sense of fulfillment when I've been able to teach somebody something. Now, would I rather, you know, want to be an exhorter or a ruler or a prophet? Or, or what if my church group starts putting, uh, how can I say, condemnation on me that my redemptive gift is not that important? I should rather be doing this or that. Or somebody else casts me in a role that is not me. What if somebody appoints me in a, in a spiritual ministry that's not me? It's going to kill me. It will literally mean the end of you. So I say, collectively, we all parts of the body of Christ. Collectively, we build the body of Christ. And we do that best by flowing in the redemptive gift that God has given to me. Do not despise it. Do not wish for something else. To embrace it. And to, to fellowship with people who actually affirm that in me. If you're hanging out with a bunch of people who break you down and criticize you and you know tell you how useless you are, where do you think that's going to take your life? Yes. I want to add something. Can I add something, Ron? Yes. 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 I just want to say it is so powerful to see when people are operating in their redemptive gifts. And if we can use you as an example, um, Franz, I know your courses and I work through most of your courses. <laughs> and maybe some of my audience uh, today don't know you so well. Uh, you uh, put two courses together. One plus one equals one. And then, um, so we all were, if I've got it correctly now. And those courses, I've watched them through a few times. And the detail and passion you have in those courses is only by your redemptive gift and you searching it out and doing it. So if anybody is listening and want to know how uh, Francis' journey was walked in, um, how can I call it, uh, your journey from finding your identity from gay and all of that and yes. teaching people that. It's just amazing. It's so comprehensive. Every question you possibly can think of asking a gay person would be answered through that teaching of yours, Franz. And I just want to say, because you obeyed or understood your identity and your gifts that God gave you, and I'm so grateful that you embraced that, because otherwise we won't have that resources available. So anyway, I'm just chipping in, but I just want to say how powerful that is. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to hear that, and it has been a privilege and a joy to put those things together. Of course, it came with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and financing, and, you know, struggling through all the ups and downs of life. And then on top of it all, I suffer bipolar depression, and uh, I honestly thank God for the medication that I'm on, because it's enabled me to live a happy, normal, and productive life. So, you know, we, we need to find ourselves in Christ so that he can guide us onto that path that he wants for us. But it comes by us searching, being hungry and uh, truly surrendering our lives to him. I love the word consecration. Consecration says, God, I give you my, my, my everything. Where you tell me to go, I'll go. What you tell me to say, I'll say. Where you tell me to stay, I'll stay. And whatever you want me to be, I will be. If we have that kind of consecration, it leads to God's dedication to guide our feet into the place where we need to be. So that we can come to the end of that little road journey and say, I've now reached my destiny. I have a sense of fulfillment. and I've been an authentic self. I did not allow people to to tell me who and what and how I should be. I've listened to one voice only, and that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
of course, that's quite a mouthful. So yeah. let's continue. So as a person, if we look at this bottom block now, and if you're drawing this or engaging with your art materials, wonderful. Just write in there your identity needs are for security, self-worth, significance. I'll embroider on that a little bit. So our basic identity need to have a firm foundation on which we can build everything else in both the natural and the supernatural realm is like a little stool on three legs. Security says, I'm secure in my main caregivers. Mom and dad love me, whether I'm fast or slow, skinny or round, whether um, you know, highly clever or a little bit not so sharp I have security in who I am because I'm loved by the people around me. there's a predictability and there's a, a consistency in those relationships so I know that if I cry mom will reach out to me if I need help dad will be there for me so I have that security that I'm okay I'm affirmed I'm loved and I'm secure in those loving relationships. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it starts with mom and dad as we small. And then eventually we have to replace that as we reach adulthood with Father God, that we have security in him. Because, hey, he's never going to fail us. He's not a backslider. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So how much security do we have in that? And part of our portrait in Christ study that I'll send out for free, you know, we have security in who we are in Jesus. And I've listed all those scriptures to you. In terms of self-worth, this is the value that I attach to myself. And that value is communicated to me, again, by my primary caregivers. So if I get neglected and rejected, my mom and dad, siblings, aunts, uncles, grannies, teachers, peer group. How much self-worth will I have? Almost nothing because I receive nothing. It means that I don't have value in the eyes of these people. So whether I live or die, it makes a difference. And then significance is what is my contribution to the universe? Am I just an oxygen thief? Or has God knit me together for a specific purpose? And that is where our gifts and talents come in, that we can use that to be a blessing, our ability to love other people and serve. And our redemptive gifts gives us great significance. In other words, the world would be a poorer place if you were no longer in it. So if those three things, if those three things are not injured in childhood, you have a great foundation. But after having counseled and shared the stories of literally hundreds of people, I can tell you that I have not met a single person who reached young adulthood with those three legs intact. Life injures us. Life on this planet is not for the faint heart. As a matter of fact, life can crush people to the point where they take their own lives through suicide. Because when these three things are broken, it leads to intense pain. And this is why soul care with creative art is so vital for me. And that is why just that section of my training is a year and a half of the three years. Where we just focus on this how this gets broken, how this gets healed. I'm moving on. So our identity needs, we can get from two sources. In the natural realm, there's the mirror of the world, the mirror that people hold up for us so that we can see in that mirror who we are. And there's a mirror of the word of God. The word of God also says a lot of who we are. We used to sing a song in church 400 years ago. <laughs> the song went like this. Whose report will you believe? The main singer sings that. And then the congregation sings back. We will believe the report of the Lord. 
don't know if you ever sang that. Okay. Yeah, the it's older a long generation. <laughs> now the older generation, like me, we all remember that song. Yeah. <laughs> so the word tells us who we are in God's eyes, and the world tells us who we are in their eyes. So let's just reflect for a moment on childhood, for example. Okay, these self-image foundations that we have. So we're constantly looking into mirrors to answer these three questions in connection to appearance, performance, importance. Appearance is how do I look? And Natasha, you've got kids and you'll know what they are. Uh, the more little they are, the more that they want to know. They put on a fancy hat to, you know, uh, do a strange costume or comb their hair or a little boy will gel his hair or put on his new clothes and then he runs into the room and he goes like, so how do I look? How do I look? <laughs> Am I right? They want to yeah. And boys, you know, they pull a muscle. They're like, oh, I'm not bad. I've got big enough muscles. Yep. And um, girls dress up like princesses, you know, like how do I look for me? Now, of course, you can either build up a child or break them down. So in terms of their appearance, we need to give children genuine compliments. Like you look handsome like this, or you're so beautiful. Or just stand there, you know, that's a Kodak moment. You can just take a picture of it. So appearance, we have to build up a child in their physical looks. Don't ever say something stupid to a child like, well, thankfully, you know, Jesus gave you um, a clever brain because with tree trunks for legs like that, I'm not sure that you're going to land a husband. But, you know, at least you'll have a good job with your brain. Now, when somebody says something like that, whether it's in a joke or whether it's for real or whether it's like to bring a child down, I don't know what, or out of spite or cruelty, for every negative thing that we hear in life, we need plus minus 25 genuine compliments to combat that. So we all have been snided or insulted in some way or another in our lives about our appearance. And not only in the words of people, but also the way that people look at us. I mean, as your ma and your pa so skeef opkijk en slag kijk en dier mekaar kijk, you don't feel good about yourself. Performance, how am I doing? Look, Dad, I just tied my shoe. Ach, nie man, jou probeer. You didn't do that, right? You can break them down and build them up. Let's say a child draws a dinosaur and it doesn't look like a dinosaur. It looks like a Ferrari. And they come and they say, look on my picture. Okay, don't say that's ugly. You know, say, well, that's really interesting. I love the color you made. And um, tell me the story of this thing. Is it alive or is it dead? If you can't figure out what it is, they will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> They'll tell you it's a dinosaur and X, Y, Z. Then make a hoo-ha out of it. Say, my darling, this is the best dinosaur I've ever seen. Now, let's stick it up on the fridge here with some magnets so that I can always remember what a clever boy you are. You know, Jesus made you so clever with those little hands. So whether they're mowing the lawn or baking a pancake or doing something and they ask the question, how's my performance? Bolt them up, don't break them down. If there's room for improvement, help them. Importance, how valuable am I? In other words, how much time do you sacrifice to spend on me? How much of your time, money, and energy do you spend on me? Or am I not important? So we measure value by quality, time, and investing into ourselves. The saddest prayer I've ever heard was a little boy who knelt down and he prayed like this. He said, dear Lord Jesus, can you please make my face square like a TV box so that daddy will also look at me? I'll shine. <laughs> so what is that child's belief system? I'm not valuable. TV is more valuable, sports, sitcoms, docuseries, you know, whatever. 
I don't have value in dad's eyes. When these three things are answered adequately, we grow up naturally with self-confidence and a good, healthy self-image. And we just light years ahead in our spiritual journey and maturity. But when these things have been destroyed in us, as they were in my childhood, my first suicide attempt was at the age of 11. And not a small attempt, a serious attempt. I mean, I took... 75% of all the medication in our home. Because these three foundations were completely broken in my world. Uh, I didn't know how to fix it. All I know that I was overwhelmingly depressed and I didn't want to live. Can I continue? That's phase one. Okay, that was page one that we did. Now we're going to page two. Yay! <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to keep you much longer. I'm going to go a little bit fast. Okay. So in, in the growing phase, we first had the knowing phase. Knowing. Okay, the growing phase is we have to inspect the fruit of our lives, what fruit is growing on my tree. If it's bad fruit, we need to fix the root. As I say, you need to face, trace, erase, and replace. Foundations have to be relayed. Your evaluation tests need to be done and great understanding of what it is that has either hampered my growth or what it is that's going to promote my growth. And to help us understand um, the psychological growth part of who we are, I've put together this little diagram based on I think it's Isaiah chapter 56 and 57. Uh, I stand under correction. But there's a description of a city with walls around it and gates that have been broken down and how the city has been devastated. And we are kind of like God's rebuilding project. So this is how I figured out the soul from the soul. I said, okay, well, there are streets with dwellings. What are the dwellings? There's a church, that's my will, my ability to make choices. The nurturing home, that's where I express and, and feel my emotions and learn about them. My intellect, I take to school. My memory banks in my soul is the museum. My temperament and perceptions, it's like a movie maker making a movie out of a book. The theater is where I act out my personality. The love nest is where I discover and act out my sexuality. The workplace, natural gifts and talents, university, my acquired skills, and role-related activities, activities uh, that kind of gives me my gender identity. And right in the middle is the temple, and that's where my born-again spirit is. Now, just because you're born again does not mean to say that there's not a traffic jam in it. So when I came to Christ, my, my walls were broken. Satan had crashed in the pool. He had written graffiti on all the buildings. There were potholes. Some of the roads were under construction. Some of these parts couldn't communicate to other parts. It was just chaos in there. So, I don't even know how to say this in words. Um, the brokenness that I had in me when I came to Jesus was so great, and thankfully, I wasn't really aware of how great it was. So truly, I became a, a, re, a, a rebuilding project, you know, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And slowly but surely, God started fixing all these areas in my life. And as I said to you, it took me about 16 years before I could finally say, you know what, I think I'm beginning to get it. I think some of the puzzle pieces in my life are beginning to, to actually work together. But it's a beautiful journey, and God sees each one of us like this. But it starts with understanding. Now, people who study psychology understand this. I mean, you have a background in psychology. So when you see a picture like this, I mean, does it make sense to you? Yes, of course. Yes, it's all the aspects of life. And I love that the born again spirit is in the middle. Because when I always demonstrate also body, soul and spirit, <laughs> the spirit in that, but 
the physical outside the body yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is broken. Uh, and the soul, definitely with the emotions and all of that and the will. Yeah. It's actually a beautiful illustration of the body, soul and spirit, this outlining you've got here. Yeah. So I, I read these scriptures and I'm like, oh, well, that's like a picture. And then you know, the Lord fleshed it out for me a bit. And a lot of what I teach is based on this. Yeah. Good. Now, um, part of art then is uh, page two. We will create a picture like this. You see, anybody can draw this, even you, Natasha. So if I put this slide up here and I say draw four blocks and draw these four things in there, just with a pencil or a pen, I'm sure you will manage. Yeah, it, it will okay. look okay. <laughs> you don't have to be a Rembrandt or Picasso or Van Gogh. Mm. <laughs> You'll be able to draw it, even a child can. Yeah. But discovering our foundations of who we are is we need to take a little bit of a walk down memory lane to go and look at the shapers from the past. What made me who I am today? What brought me to this place of brokenness? People and events have influenced us in our formative years for better or for worse. And I haven't met a person yet who does not have a need for healing. Not one. Yeah. We come from dysfunctional families. All families on earth are dysfunctional. It's just the degree of dysfunction that varies from household to household. That was quite a shock for me. Because growing up where I did with the nice parents I had in a cute society in a small town in Paris, I thought, no, we were pretty cool people, you know. <laughs> my dad had five butcheries. My mom was the president of the Frauerland boat in him. And, um, you know, we were like part of the people in the town. Little did I realize the dysfunction in it until later years when I started learning about this stuff and, and God showing me the roots of dysfunction. Rejection. Wow. What a topic. Yeah. In the in hours soul care just training, <laughs> I spend a month and a half just on rejection. I can believe that. <laughs> to define what it is, what it looks like, how it comes about, what it does to a person, all the different roots of it, the different branches and fruit. And for a lot of us, our rejection is still showing because of brokenness is there. Then the shame of sexual molest. Statistics tell us that 66% of girls are molested. And 33% of boys are molested before the age of 16. That's so sad. So next time you sit in church, look at the people around you and ask yourself, which 66%, six out of every 10 women in this church this morning were molested? And which three out of 10 men in this church were molested as children? Not something you talk about because it's shameful. Yes. And of all the hundreds of students that I've had and part of their training is to write out their life story, which is for my eyes only. The statistics are even higher in my, my student body through the years. I would say that 85% of girls were molested and approximately 55% of men that I've encountered in my journey. And because it's such a massive wound and it has such a huge impact on who we are, it is something that has to be addressed. And I often wish that churches would just invite me to come and talk about this topic from the pulpit, you know, for about six hours. Because every church in this country needs to hear this message. But we're not getting it out there fast enough. And every day that we remain silent, there are more victims that become victimized by this horrid thing that can happen. So a huge part of my training focuses on that, to bring about healing for the individual and to equip us to help other people. Then, of course, trauma. There are so many types of traumas going on. 
And I think South Africa is a highly traumatized society. Trauma is very specific, all depends on your age and what it is. And trauma is a broad field. And you know, tonight's forum is not one where we can pause to. And that's why I want you to enroll for the training. Yeah. You know, I need yeah. you to come and can work with me. We can become world changers. And yeah, you know, I've been in this business now. Well, I wouldn't call it a business. I've been in the <laughs> in the people helping people industry in the ministry for 27 years and I have not touched enough lives I haven't that's why yeah. I think it's great for me to train people because for every person that I train they can go and help hundreds of other people and we need to inspire each other to this and you know we're living in times that are getting darker and darker and this next generation I can't even tell you how lost they are Really, yeah. people everywhere are they just we need not so aware of it in South Africa, but in Europe and Asia and Japan and America. It's heartbreaking what's going on there. Okay, so we, we take a little walk down memory lane and we say, Lord, well, shine your spotlight. What is a brokenness? And then the third step is flowing. Flowing is where we begin to bear fruit of righteousness, fruit for the kingdom and fruit in ministry and you know, just flourishing as human beings. That there is true transformation. That we can add eternal value to the world around us. We can be busy with secular things, but you know, it doesn't really have eternal value. It doesn't really. I mean, I had a clothing factory for 16 years. I designed and made dresses every day of my life. I had welts on my fingers from cutting with a scissor. I was permanently pricked with pins. I could sew on buttons and shoulder pads with my eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> and I always felt like, what a waste of my life for 16 years. Mm. Sure, we did some great things, you know. I employed people, 65 people working in the factory. It was nice, you know, to do job creation. It was lovely to be able to take care of parents and siblings and you know we had money and we traveled and it was wonderful but i always felt like this doesn't have eternal value i mean giving people jobs and you know a living does this have eternal value is this building the kingdom of god and i was so relieved when eventually the lord said to me now's the time for ministry i'm like yay <laughs> And even sitting and talking to you, Natasha, I feel like, you know, this is the stuff of life. And oh, things that matter. And, yeah, it's like stuff that matters. It's weighty, it's eternal. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, when you see a person transformed and, and they're growing in Jesus, I mean, what has more value than that? Yes. And then learning to reflect his image through my image. So it's not about me. It's not about me becoming famous or great or wonderful. It's like how much of Jesus can be seen in me, heard through me, and experienced through me. Instead of brokenness, my misery, my humanness, or my conceited pride, what, what do we really want to show? So this is the third part of this exercise. I have the page right here, and you have it on your screen. And these are the three steps that are summarized here. Okay, we've looked at the past. Now let's look at the future. What are the shapers for the future? It's the ongoing work of sanctification under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Allows the believer to be transformed from glory to glory to glory into his image. And this is the good work that God begins in us. And he's faithful and he's just, and he will complete it until the day of Christ. Can you and I do this in our own strength? No. Can a psychologist do this for somebody? No. Can I bring this about in somebody? No. Can we help people? Yes. And give them pointers. But at the end of the day, this is the miracle of being a Christian. Is that we can renounce the old labels. You know those mirrors that people hold up for us? 
we announced that we reject the old labels from the past. That's what it means. I renounce, the, I announce, I reject. The labels that were put on me was Morphe, Trassi, Queer, Faggot, Sissy Boy, Mama's Boy, Pansy, Ballerina. What else? That's a lot. I can't remember all. And you know what? Those things shaped me. By the time that I was 16 years old, I was actually convinced I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body. And the only way that I can ever find happiness is to maybe go for sex reassignment surgery. If I was America in America at age 16 today, you don't even need permission from your parents to do that. You can self-diagnose, go to a therapist, and they put you on hormone blockers immediately within the hour. Yeah. That's how bad our world has become. So Jesus showed me in his kindness and love that I'm not those things and that it's time for me to stand up and to renounce those things, to say, I will not walk in alignment anymore with what people told me. Maybe my dad said this, but it's not truth. My mom said that it's not the truth. My peer group XYZ, I will not let those things shape. So I'm going to relearn who I am. I'm either going to believe the lies of the world or the truth of the word. So this is where we study our portrait in Christ and we make regular proclamations. Natasha, do you know how I studied this? I was 21 years old. I was freshly born again. I started learning about you know, this portrait in Christ. And I took all the scripture verses and I wrote them out on little yellow post-it notes. Each scripture I wrote it out. And I said, right, I'm going to learn this stuff because I, I, my head is so messed up with lies and, you know, false labels that I even put on myself. And I'm going to wash my mind and my heart clean by meditating on these verses because this is who God says that I am. And I write them on those yellow, little yellow. I put them behind the toilet door, next to the loo, next to my bed, on the lamp, on the mirror. I almost said, do I do my makeup? No, in the mirror, we <laughs> brush my teeth, comb my hair, shake my face. Um, I put them in my car, on the dashboard, on my books. So every so many minutes of a day, I would be confronted by one of those scriptures, and then I'd pause. Go, okay, let me read this out aloud like a proclamation. Let me believe it. Let me receive it. Lord, please put this truth in my spirit. Because in my deepest being, I believe this nonsense. And the devil has put on me. Because that's what shaped who I was. No, no. So I had to relearn, and it took a long time. And then you begin to reflect. You show the world who God has anointed and appointed you to be, unapologetically. Oh. You step out in boldness, and you do whatever the heck it is that God is telling you to do, whether people like it or not, whether they recognize you or not. Yes. I have been rejected outrightly by three ministries in my life. Where God said to me, go and tell them that you're supposed to do this. And I outrightly told me, no, you're not good enough. No, you can't do that. No, we don't believe in you. No, maybe God is saying something else to you. Mm. So reflect means if God tells you to bake cakes and take it to the orphans, then that's what you do, whether you get criticized or not. If God tells you to pick up a paintbrush and go teach other people about Jesus by painting the face of Jesus from a coloring book. And that's what you do. You reflect your redemptive gift and the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word by becoming that and striving to be that in everything. So whether you do plumbing or sewing or teaching or homemaking or decorating or hairdressing, or art, or whatever profession you have. If we do everything as unto the Lord, 
we can reflect Jesus in us. Now, that's what I wanted to share with you. I'm going to stop the screen. Oh, there you stop. Natasha, what do you want to add? Well, you ended in such a high note. I can always feel and see how we live in victory. Just, uh -huh. But it's an incredible journey that you shared, took us on today. It was an a in-depth journey. Uh, France, I didn't even realize you're going to go so much in depth. You shared so much. Um, maybe some people have some questions and I think that I must actually put in the, um, you can send us an email. How can we contact you or if anybody wants to get involved? So I know maybe, maybe I can take one step back. I know you have something coming up uh, that we want people to get involved. Maybe they can come and ask their questions there or they can send us an email. But let's talk about that open day coming up. <laughs> Tell us more about that. Maybe people yes, will come and, and ask. A lot of people want to enroll for the training and they're not very certain of you know, what it all entails. And I think it's because it's a unique and new way of training people um, that they can't really relate to it. You know, if I was advertising uh, a, a theological course at a Bible college on the topic of marriage, everybody kind of like, oh, well, yeah, we're going to learn. But now soul care with creative art, it's a bit of a new concept for people to wrap their minds around because they think the focus is on art. So this coming Monday the 7th, we're having an open day here at my art studio. You can either attend it in person or you can join us on Zoom. It's a hybrid class. So um, you just have to reserve your spot by going to our landing page. And darling Natasha is going to give you all that information, how to do that. Or you can just contact her directly on Facebook or, or email her myself. And then um, you can reserve your spot for Monday to be part of that so that you can actually do a class with me. It's a three hour class. The curriculum will be focusing specifically on loving your neighbor and that is your physical neighbor in your neighborhood. It's going to be a real fun evening. And of course you can join in the morning as well. There's a class at nine o'clock in the morning or a class at six o'clock in the evening. It's a three hour lesson and um, we will also send you a little list of the art materials that you will be needing. Very simplistic things. You probably already have them in your house. And um, it's for free. That's the good news. It will give you an insight as to the class and how it's run. And you will be joining in with my third years for this oh, specific okay. day. So it's just a little glimpse into the life of a student with me. Wow, thanks, Franz. I think that would be fantastic. I, I think I will join as well. I didn't sign up yet, but I want to join that class uh, as well. So I, <laughs> I put it in the chat, uh, in the chat, in the comment section of Facebook Live. Um, yes. So if anybody completes that, I believe we will uh, make sure we give them all the information, the Zoom links, or let us know or let Franz know when you are joining, what time. Okay, and thanks for offering that for free. I think it's a very powerful opportunity to see how it works uh, and actually be part of a group of people uh, that's like-minded um, and wanting yeah. to serve God in a different way. And, yeah. and I know I did some of the art, the ones that you showed today with you, and it's powerful how it actually makes you as the student transform your own life. I'm thinking always about my clients, but I also how it affects me, it's very powerful. So you don't have to use this even in a ministry setting. You can just, your own life will be transformed because I had that experience as well. I just want to comment on that. <laughs> yeah, so um, Franz, we were, uh, I took a lot of your time today. So I want to thank you for being here. Um, reach out, uh, uh, there's also your email address. Maybe we can just comment on your email address uh, if people are watching yeah, on it's, YouTube. It's very easy. Uh, yes. France at Lamb Ministries. Lamb like a small sheep. And uh, not a lamp that you light with a candle in it, a lamb, a, a scarpy. So it's France at lambministries.co.za. Okay. 
so they can reach out to you there. And if anybody is on my page and want to know more about France's programs, you're also welcome to do that. Um, thanks, France, for sharing your um, knowledge. It's very powerful. And I hope to talk to you again, uh, maybe on this platform or another way. Uh, I know you have a lot to share. So thanks for joining us today. I don't like ending off. <laughs> if you let me go, I will <laughs> be um, teaching you for the next 400 hours yep. because it's just a joy for me to discuss things that are really you know, life in, uh, of life importance. And I think it's because it's been so precious in my own journey that I just love to see people grow and to be healed and to be restored. Well, I can hear it in your passion as you are sharing. So thanks for that, Ron. Natasha, <laughs> you're a wonderful host. Thanks, thanks for so. setting this up. Uh, big pleasure. Have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Close to you.